Well, good morning to you all. Welcome to our devotion today. Good to connect with you as we continue to deal with the fruit of the Spirit. And we are dealing with joy today. And uh, I always think of that chorus that we used to sing as children, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And we'll be referring to that scripture a little later. Uh, joy certainly is an ingredient that seems to be so absent from our lives today and in all the uh, pressure situations, the uncertainty, the conflict and so on. In our world today, there seems to be an absence of joy and we want to focus on this fruit. It's such a crucial fruit uh, to cultivate in our lives, the fruit of joy and uh, to have joy in spite of our circumstances is really what we're talking about. Uh, I remember reading uh, a column that was giving a whole lot of uh, different scenarios where you know it's going to be a bad day. And uh, I'm sure you know many of these. But the one that just really uh, struck a chord uh, for me was you know it's going to be a day, bad day when your hooter sticks on the freeway behind a group of hell's angels. Or your birthday cake collapses from the weight of the candles. Yeah, getting there. <laughs> when you put your pants on backwards and they fit you better. Uh, or when you sink your teeth into a beautiful steak and they stay there. Uh, you know, then you know you're going to have a bad day. And I think we so often start our day uh, badly by thinking of some of these scenarios that uh, uh, seem to be part and parcel of our lives. The thing is... The scriptures tell us that we can have joy on those kinds of days. And we do need to realize that joy in scripture is not happiness. Uh, happiness is external. Joy is internal. Happiness is based on chance. Joy is based on choice. Happiness is based on circumstances. Joy is based on on Christ. Happiness comes from the old English word hap, which literally means chance. It corresponds to the Latin word fortuna, and that's not the make of a vehicle. It actually is the word for fortunate, which means luck. You're lucky. You're fortunate. Okay, And that's where your happiness comes, is when you have good luck or good fortune. And these words suggest that if things happen the way we want them to happen, then we, we're happy. But when you read the scriptures, one of the first things that's apparent is that God wants his people to be joyful. In fact, I think one of the greatest paradoxes of life is to encounter so many of those who claim to be Christians who just lack any joy. We ought to be the most joyful people on earth. Because of the hope that is in us. Joy is at the heart of who God is. And we will never understand the significance of joy in human life until we understand its importance to God. I love the words that came from G.K. Chesterton. Uh, as we know, he was just such a great theologian and thinker and writer. And in his book called Orthodoxy, Chesterton writes about how the joy that you see in a little child is just a fraction of the joy that exists in the heart of God. Let me read it for you. Because children have a bounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, Do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has an eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we. 
Just those words, we have sinned and grown old, jaded, tired, worried, irritated, rushed, blind. We have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we. That's our God. That's the joy that our God has. Imagine for a few moments what the opening sentences of the Bible might have been like if God were not a supremely joyful being. What might Genesis look like if God approached his work in the way that we so often approach ours? I had this little extract or excerpt filed under Fruit of the Spirit. I don't quite remember where it came from. It might have been John Maxwell, but I want to share it with you. So this is the version. In the beginning, it was nine o'clock, so God reluctantly went out to work. He filled out a requisition to separate light from darkness. He considered making stars to beautify the night and planets to fill the skies, but it frankly sounded like too much hard work. And besides, he thought, it's not in my job description. And so he decided to leave for home early and call it a day. And he looked at all that he had done and said, it'll just have to do. On the second day, God separated the waters from the dry land and he made all the dry land flat, plain and functional. So that behold, the whole earth looked like Gauteng. He thought about making mountains, valleys, glaciers, jungles and forests, but decided it wouldn't be worth the effort. And God looked at what he had done that day and God said, It'll just have to do. And God made a dove to fly in the air and an eel to swim in the waters and a cat to creep upon the dry ground. And God thought about making millions of other species of all sizes and shapes and colors. But he was tired and couldn't feel bothered. He wasn't even that crazy about the cat. <laughs> so God looked at all that he had done and said, it'll just have to do. And at the end of the week, God was seriously burnt out. And so he breathed a big sigh of relief and said, Thank me, it's Friday. What a great insight into how Genesis might have been written had God been a joyless God. What a contrast to the refrain, our refrain, that we have so often when it comes to our work and the refrain that we actually have in Scripture, it says God spoke and it was so, and God saw it was good. He created man and it was very good. And so it is with God, but not with us. For we have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we. Friends, God is no killjoy. He invented fun. We have said that the fruit of the Spirit reveals the character of God. And the same is true here. God is, is the source of joy. He's the epitome of joy. God is filled with joy. Psalm 104 speaks of God rejoicing over everything that he had created. In Isaiah 65, verse 18 to 19, we read those words as God encourages his people, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. What beautiful words those are in Zephaniah 3.17. Not a book we often quote from, but this verse is so apt. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Just think about that. That God rejoices over us with singing. That God delights in us. And then you come to the New Testament. You think of the parables of Jesus. I mean, Jesus tells three parables in Luke 15. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And in each of these stories, there is exceeding joy when the lost is found. Jesus says, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. With the return of the prodigal son, the father, who's, who's just this picture of God, says, let us have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was lost and now has been found. 
joy and delight are his characteristics, something God clearly wants to see in us. The writer to the Hebrews looks back at this time and he writes in Hebrews 12 verse 2, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and scorned its shame. It almost sounds like an oxymoron that for the joy set before him, you serious? The cross, the agony and the suffering of the cross. Jesus' joy comes from knowing the delight of his father. When the penalty for sin will finally be dealt with and reconciliation with God will be made possible. Joy is something that is internal. It comes from within. It is a fruit that is produced in us by the Holy Spirit. It comes from deep within us. It is something that gives us strength for the joy of the Lord in Nehemiah 8 verse 10 is our strength. And so my prayer for all of us today is that, that we will allow that fruit to grow in us, the, the joy of the Lord, that it will truly be our strength each and every day. And so on that note, we're going to look next time at different Hebrew words for joy and try and understand this picture of joy that the Scriptures gives to us. And I pray that, that God will turn our mourning into joy. God will turn our, our sorrow into joy. That despite the circumstances, that we will know the joy of the Lord that is our strength. So let us pray together. Lord, we just thank you that the joy of the Lord is our strength. We have every reason to be joyful. Lord, we, we so often uh, carry around morbidity and sorrow and anxiety and worry and, and all of these negatives that rob us and sap us of our joy. We pray, Lord God, that we might just go into this day and see this day differently and see the many blessings that you have poured out into our lives and that we would truly be able to declare with the writer that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so bless us as we go into this day and just continue to fill us with your joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a joyful day, a joyful day, and may the Lord be your joy today. God bless you.